Sir, a second video hit this month. Dang, this kind of zoomed up on me. So, just a devlog this time. Again, C is sparking too much joy, so I've been working on my from scratch standalone GD script LSP instead of any games. Smart use of my time? Probably not, but I'm having fun, and dare I say it? I am actually improving as a programmer. Just insane. But before all that, Here's something I've been thinking about. You know how there are rail otakus, aka foamers, people that are really into trains? You ever think that there were trireme otaku back in classical Greece and Rome? I certainly hope so. Historical tangent aside, this is primarily going to be about the siren call of speed, since I basically assume that my diehard viewer, aka anyone that clicks on this video, is smarter than me. I will assume we all know what Big O is, but going against what I just said, Big O is a way to describe how long a function runs as you give it more and more items to process. O of 1 means it's constant, O of n means it increases with the number of items linearly, O log n, logarithmic increase. Log of x is significantly less than x as x approaches positive infinity. So big O log of n is algorithmically faster than big O of n. Now, I haven't finished reading the DoD book, but I'm trying to rip absolutely thick memory allocations and never call free. You free your memory? Cringe. That's war spoils. The war? Iraq 2. Also, it's super easy to serialize if all your allocations come from a contiguous block of memory instead of calling free or new wantonly. Just relativize all the pointers and mem copy that bad boy. Long story short, I'm writing custom memory allocators, and I implemented a free list that uses linked lists under the hood. Compared to an arena, free lists can actually reuse specific chunks of memory it previously allocated, instead of just reusing the tail or restarting from scratch. And compared to pools, the allocations of free lists can be different arbitrary sizes, which are two useful properties, seeing as how I'm going to have to make abstract syntax trees, and I would prefer to use arrays instead of linked lists because... Also, it's super easy to serialize if all your allocations come from a contiguous block of memory instead of calling free or new wantonly. So this brings us to speed. I have Titanfall brain rot. That's ringing in your ears, son. Stop this. So I have a primordial desire for it, meaning O log n, sexier than O of n. Link list, cringe, O of n. Binary tree, based, O log n, but worst case O of n. Self-balancing binary tree, however, oh my god, absolute cinema, O log n, period. You know what that means? Speed is life. So I implemented an AVL tree. Look at the time complexity. Ah, beautiful. At first, I tried implementing a red-black tree, but I'll be honest, maybe it was because I was still out of it after barfing for a few days, but my brain could not handle red-black trees. There were too many cases for node removal, and I needed to nap. Whereas the AVL tree is just see if you gotta rebalance, and then just rebalance. Balancing is the same for node insertion and deletion, so it's much more straightforward than not only red-black trees, but also how AVL trees are presented online. It's even simpler than how Wikipedia presents it. Also, much ink has been spilled about how the color of a node in a red-black tree can be represented by a single bit, whereas nodes in AVL trees have to store their height, which is way more than one bit. Listen. First off, it's never one bit, it's gotta be at least a byte, meaning you have seven junk bits, which admittedly, maybe you can find a use for them, whatever. But second, I just don't care, because after all, remember, this is for a custom memory allocator, and I'm gonna be taking massive rips of memory, so who cares if it's 40 bytes or 33 bytes. Personally, I don't. So, not sour grapes. I honestly think red-black trees for custom memory allocators are just overrated. Plus, the additional graph height information allows you to use a perfectly sized stack to traverse the AVL tree instead of using recursion which is based. While I have you, look at this gorgeous use of union. I think this is one of the actually clever things I've done with C. Also, another reason to use AVL trees, they were discovered by Soviet mathematicians, and my faith in Soviet mathematicians is just a single step below Jesus Christ. A math degree does that to you. So my beautiful, self-balancing Soviet AVL tree is smoking that linked list. 
is what I would say if I were a liar. As much as I wanted to not believe the test data, the good old link list is performing better. I set up both to allocate, decrease the allocation, and then free set allocation 10 million times, and the link list is, again, doing better. I'm even tipping the scales by testing the AVL tree second, so that way it's warmed up. Why is this happening? Honestly, the link list based variant never really hits a point where big O performance matters. After 10 million allocations and freeze, the list is just 35 elements long, which is not long at all. So big O performance becomes irrelevant. And while the AVL tree is just as small as the link list, it has a bit more heft when it comes to insertion and way more heft when it comes to deletion, which is probably what's slowing it down over those 10 million iterations. Sorry, O oh, login enjoyers, link lists get the job done. So the takeaway, if there is any, implement both versions, test them, then choose what's best. Also, attempt I may have found GCC and Clang bugs, or I'm just ass, which is much more likely. Here's the context. Look at this handy dandy little doodad. I love it. Part of the joy of working on this project is knowing when I wrote something so useful, I'd happily reuse it in another project. And this scratch allocator is just that. Basically, while I was working, I found myself just needing a touch of memory here a dollop there, and I'm trying to think of memory allocations as cohorts instead of individuals. So because of that, I wrote this scratch allocator. It's just an arena with dynamic memory, but since it's static and it gets initialized before main, thanks to this here attribute constructor, I can always just take some memory for a little something something whenever I need to. Dangling pointers, just don't use the pointers beyond the scope. It's a scratch allocator after all. So how do I find this possible bug? Ideally, I want the scratch memory to be super easy peasy to reuse since 100% of the time, I just want it for a single scope, a single function, and then I'm done with it. Now, supposedly attribute cleanup function runs the argument function whenever a variable loses scope. So I wrote this little macro to make my life easier and automatically release the scratch memory I allocated after I'm done with it. Even though I do not need to do such a thing since at the end of the main loop, I just set the scratch arena size back to zero, in effect, resetting the entire thing. But you know the saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Turns out, I either do not understand how the cleanup attribute works, or it's broken. Because when I compiled everything with GCC, the cleanup function would run immediately before I even got some scratch memory, which of course triggered my asserts. Think I'm crazy? Look at this backtrace. Check the line numbers. I may be crazy, but I ain't wrong. Then I recompiled with Clang instead of GCC, and then, uh-oh. Now, I do think that the galaxy brains that make compilers are smart unlike me. So I'm confident that I just don't know how to use the cleanup attribute. But reading from the GCC docs, quote, the cleanup attribute runs a function when the variable goes out of scope. The function must take one parameter, a pointer to a type compatible with the variable, end quote. I read that and despite all my self-doubt, I think I'm doing it properly. So bug or dumb, let me know in the comments. Or maybe it's bug and dumb. That's another option. Or maybe GCC CC15 will fix everything and I'll have to recheck when that comes out. Okay, no more devlog. Bit shorter than usual because I started reading the first of a tetralogy of books while I was sick and it was just so gripping that I had to finish it and the remaining three books immediately. So, book review. Gene Wolfe's The Long Sun is great. It's sci-fi, but in a way that's not really. I liked it more than his Earth of the New Sun series. If you have never read Wolf before, you really gotta flip on your neurons while reading. I found myself referring to the first pages of the first book time and time again, just to recontextualize what I finished reading. And while the Long Sun references classical philosophy and Catholic theology, Wolf was a convert, to construct its themes, the main narrative is so fun, you can read it and enjoy it without worrying about the deeper messages. But they're there, and they really got my noggin jogging. And fun Gene Wolfe trivia fact, it is quite possible that he is the inspiration for the Pringles Man appearance since he designed and engineered their baking process. And that's it for this video. As always, thank you for watching. I appreciate your time, and I hope you have a good day. If you liked the video, please give it a like and subscribe for whatever comes next. While I haven't done any recreational programming live streams, what with me reading four books and all, I still plan to do more, unless I 
I start reading another book series. There's also a Discord server where you're welcome to talk about math, game dev, programming, books, and baking. And speaking of baking, let's get to it. All right, no bread. However, we do have palmier cookies. And I will admit they are a little toasty on the outside, but personally, I think that's a good thing, you know. It's sort of like the top on a creme brulee where it's not only caramelized, it's even a little burnt, so it's just it's sweet, it's bitter, it's complex, it's it's dark caramel flavored. I'm not coping. This is not a cope. I think it's good. Um and so and I think I made this yeah, this is from last year. I think this was for Easter, if memory serves. Um, but let's take a look at the next set of pictures. And honestly, the next three pictures are, again, just close-ups of all of them. So uh, what's really, again, I just use a rough puff pastry, but I always get these gorgeous layers. And again, um, rough puff pastry, super easy to make. I highly recommend it. Let's, you know, let's cycle through these and well, I love it. Apparently my friend, uh, well, one of my friends in, uh, he, he lives in the Netherlands. He says that they make them with cheese over there. So I really, I got to try that because that sounds great. Not even just no sugar, just, well, maybe on the outside. So it gets a little, you know, gets, gets good. And I, I've got to figure out what type of cheese to use. You know, I'm, instantly gravitate towards ricotta but that might be a little too wet so i don't know i don't know but honestly ricotta sugar that goes hard you know i love a good cannoli if you don't like cannoli my man <laughs> oh speaking of ricotta and sugar have you tried cannoli <laughs> uh but yeah here's the I, these photos aren't exactly in order if we look at uh yeah oops the wrong way my bad my apologies now now here's the same and yeah as you can see yeah they kind of a little toasty but still delicious and um yeah that's that's that uh I'm going to use a guilty conscience. I'm going to use the sign-off today. Uh, the yeast in the air is free, so go out there and bake. You don't have to use yeast, but you can. You can. You can. It's an option. I got sidetracked. It's nutritious. It's delicious. It's good for you. It's good for the soul. And it's a great, and it's a great gift, and it's a great way to show people that you appreciate them. And I appreciate all of you. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.